Welcome to The Simple Truth. I'm John Furness, your teacher. Um, I hope you've got your Bibles out and you're ready to, to listen and, and write down some notes and, and to study it out yourself because it's important that you study the Word, not just have someone sit here and teach it to you, but, but to open up the Word, read it, study it, uh, ingest it, uh, apply it to your life. Um, when I first came to the Lord, uh, some 30, some, yeah, probably 30 years ago, um, shortly after I got, we, we had a lot of teaching about the anointing of Christ and how we are anointed. And so uh, now that we don't talk about it much, I've been wanting to do a series uh, on the fullness of Christ and talk about this anointing that God has put on our lives. And my key verse for the next two or three weeks is going to be uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 16. And it reads, And of His fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. And I'm going to bring that back to you in, in a little bit. But first I want to bring us up to it. I want us to go back to the first part of this chapter in the Gospel of John, and uh, and uh, teach uh, up to that, and and explain that verse in more detail, and and on through. Um, I want you to understand when we talk about the anointing of Christ, we're talking about in the Old Testament would give us a picture. The high priest would be anointed with oil, and they would pour it over his head. It would come down over his head, over his beard, over his clothing that he had, and drip off. Uh, to his feet. And that is a picture of the anointing that Christ, the head of the church, has for the church. And you and I, believers in Christ, accept that anointing and receive it through what Jesus has done. And you and I are anointed, not by anything we've done, but by the love of God and the obedience of Christ to to reconcile us back to him into the kingdom of God. But I want to start with verse 1 in, in the Gospel of John. And I'm just going to take, my, I'm going to try to slow down and take my time. I know I get in a hurry when the anointing hits. I just go fast. Um, I don't mean to, but, but, but I want, want to get this across to you. The first verse, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined into the darkness, and the darkness did not com comprehend it. Now, in these verses, we have a picture, again, of in uh, Genesis chapter 1, uh, and when it talks about the Word here, in the beginning was the Word, we're talking about Jesus, but we're talking about spoken Word. We're not just talking about logos, the written Word, or a written thought. This is spoken. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, you, you remember uh, many, when, G, when God was creating, um, we have the Holy Spirit hoovering over uh, the earth and and God would say let there be light for one of the things um, and he spoke it out that's how important that it is that you and I speak out the word of God because that gives it empowerment uh, that brings uh, life to the word and, and we speak that out and God spoke out what he believed what he wanted, and what he had faith, believe it, can you believe that? God has faith that it would happen, period. And it does happen, and it will happen. Uh, so the word here is Jesus Christ, but it's the spoken word. And we find that not, he gives us this, this uh, idea, uh, uh, the word was with God, it was in God, it was a part of God, and was God. You realize his word is a part of him, and we're describing Jesus as his word spoken to bring to life those things around us. 
He said in the beginning he was with God. There's this uh, picture of the, tri the Trinity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we're talking mainly right now about the, the work of of the word Jesus but it's empowered by the Holy Spirit uh, it says all things were made through him without him nothing was made everything that was brought into creation all creation was made by Christ was made by the speaking forth of the word it is important for us to understand that speaking forth is very important in our lives also uh, we speak what we believe. We speak in faith that God will perform it because he has given us the word to say. Uh, verse 4, he says, in him was life. Now, we're not talking just about physical life that we have right now. But he's talking about, in the Greek, called zoe, which is uh, eternal life. Uh, continuing life. Uh, it is above this physical life that you and I have right now. Uh, understand, you and I, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we are a spirit being living in a physical body. But we have the life that Christ gives to us, which is the eternal life. And he says uh, that life was the light to men. In other words, his life through him gives eternal life to men and that light, that revelation of eternal life becomes manifested in your life, my life, and all who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ came to show us not only the love of God, but to be the sacrifice that was needed for us to be forgiven. And he said in verse 5, the light shined in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. It did not um, lay hold of it. It did not ob obtain it. Uh, it was the light was not overcome by darkness. Uh, it, it's almost like you're saying the darkness did not understand or have the revelation of what the light was doing. And that light is Jesus Christ in the world. Uh, he had brought to us. So these are things that we, we read about, but we needed to go a little bit farther than just read about it. We need to put it into our lives and understand what, what Christ is really saying to us through his word in this aspect and bring about who he is. Now, verse 6, we change the subject a little bit. Uh, we talk about John the baptizer. Uh, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And again, this is John the baptizer. Uh, this man came for a witness to bear witness of the light, Jesus, that all through him might believe. Uh, he was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Uh, here he's talking about that this, this man that we call John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, uh, he was sent to be a witness for God of the coming Messiah, the coming of Christ, the anointed one. He was not the light. He was just lifting up the light, which is a picture of what you and I should be doing. We need to lift up Jesus, who is the light of the world, who is the revelation of God, who is the, the example that we have of God. We lift him up. It's the idea of, of a candlestick with the light on the top of it. We lift it up. We witness for him so that he will be the one seen. And it's from his revelation that brings people to Christ and to bring them into salvation and to give them this life, this zoe, this, this eternal life that we're talking about. Verse 9, that was <clears throat> the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world, giving revelation, giving sight. You, you can't see in the darkness, okay? But when the light comes on, 
you have revelation and you can see what it is. I one time was, was uh, talking to a young man who came to my house and he was wanting to know about this, this uh, Jesus and this how to be saved. And uh, we were standing in the living room and, and yet in my dining room the light was off and I said, what can you see in that dining room? And he said, well, nothing. They, the light's off. I can't see anything. And I said, yet yeah, when we walk in there and the light comes on, you can see the blue, the pretty, how beautiful that room is, but not until the light comes on. And that is the way it is with salvation until the light, the revelation of Christ comes on. We don't understand or don't see, don't comprehend who he really is and what he has for us. And that the idea of, of knowing about the fullness is to understand that we have the fullness of Christ, not because of who I am, but because who Jesus is and what he's done. Uh, verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. Now get this idea here. He was in the world. He came into the world that he created. Remember, back in, the, in uh, chap, chapter 1, verse 3, uh, all things were made through him. This all creation he made. And yet when he came into this world, this creation didn't know him. Uh, it's kind of a sad commentary, but it's what he's saying to us. I was not recognized by the very creation that I created. Verse, that's the first part of this, okay? That's, that's one. Now, I want to see number two. The second one is verse 11. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Now, in the Old Testament, you know that, that the Israelites were considered to be God's chosen people. And yet, when he came into the world, he came into this, this creation that he created, including uh, the Jewish nation, including you and I, uh, we did not receive him. We did not accept him. We didn't know who he was. Uh, we didn't understand what he was trying to do, uh, what his mission was. Do you understand that Jesus was a missionary to his own creation to have you and me in his kingdom? So we didn't understand it. So he had his creation, the world, didn't receive him. His chosen people didn't receive him. And now we have that opportunity. Verse 12, but, here, here's the but. Here's, he's just told us the world didn't receive me. My creation didn't receive me. My chosen people didn't receive me. But, and we always want to see what the but is because that is an important part here. But as many received him, talking about Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. And I want to, I want to, the, 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 verse 13 goes along with this, but right now I want to talk about verse 12. It says that many that receive him, who accept him, who trust in what he says, who has the uh, revelation that God's love has been poured out on you and I so that we can become children of God. We're no longer in darkness, but we've come into the light through the revelation of the light, Jesus Christ, that we're now not in that dark kingdom, but we're in the kingdom of light, or we can very well say the kingdom of God. Now, Verse 13, now let's go back and start with, with the middle of, of 12. To those who believe in his name, we're talking about his name. We're talking about the name of Jesus. Who was born, talking about Jesus. Who was born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It talks about his virgin birth. It's talking about he did not come into this world in a natural reproductive way that we are familiar with. He came into this world by the will of God at the exact time that God had planned for his appearance. That 
that gave you and I, Gentiles, uh, and not only us, but, but Jewish people too, to know who he is and to live out Christ in our lives and to have that, that opportunity to choose Jesus and have the right or the ability to become sons and daughters of God. We changed families. We changed into the family of God. Uh, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, the Word... We've had, we've had uh, a picture of Jesus as the Word, spoken Word. We have a picture of Jesus as the light, the revelation that comes from the Word of God. And now, the Word, Jesus, has become flesh. If you remember the prophecy that was given, I believe it was in Isaiah, that His name would be Emmanuel, or translated, God with us. This is fulfilling the prophecy of God with us. He, he became flesh. He put aside his glory as a divine uh, individual, uh, as God, and was willing to come and become human, like you and I, in the flesh, and live as we do. And yet, to be an example that we should be following after and we beheld his glory, and he's talking about the glory of, of his physical body, but it's also talking about the glory of the only begotten of the Father. In other words, this unique son that was brought into this world that he created, and the glory, we see the glory of God in his presence. And the Father's you know, he's, he's the only begotten. He's the only true, that only uh, 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 unique son that God has. The rest of us are adopted. But that doesn't take away uh, what we have in him. And he said he's full of grace and truth. He's full. He's complete. He has the completion of the grace of God and the truth of God. He has it all. In this, uh, in his in his name, I, I looked up this uh, the glory. Going back to the glory, and it's the honor. It, in the strong concordance, it, it this word in the Greek, and I can't say it, so I won't try. Uh, it says that it is the glory, the praise, and the worship. All in that talking about grace, we have that undeserving love that God has for us and he brought it to us and showed it to us through the life of Jesus Christ uh, and the truth he is the truth he is the way uh, he is the life um, now when, when the Jews heard that they understood what he was saying because in the temple uh, especially the, the tabernacle in the wilderness the first curtain that you went through was the way. When you went into the holy place, that curtain was called the truth. And when it went into the holy of holies, that was curtain was called the life. They understood that. Many of us today, we don't understand that, but we, through him, we do. Uh, and then uh, verse 15, uh, John bore witness of him and cried out saying that he who was of whom I said, uh, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. He's talking about the eternal uh, aspect of Jesus. Uh, in, in this physical world, he came after John. John was born before Jesus. Uh, but John's also saying Jesus is preferred before me because he was already before me in the eternal past when it was just God Jesus was there and now uh, John was that witness uh, that one crying in the wilderness that, that, that 
was a witness of who Jesus was and that he was coming into the world. And John, you remember, he preached uh, righteousness and repentance. And repentance takes us to that place where we're ready to accept Jesus, that we understand that we need a Savior, that we understand that we need to have someone to pay the price that we can't pay. And so he said he's a witness, and he's talking about, uh, I'm not the one, but one comes after me that is preferred over me. In verse 16, our key verse, uh, and of his fullness, talking about the fullness of Jesus, we have all received and grace for grace. In other words, we have received the fullness of Christ when we accept him. Now, we don't think of that as that way. We, don't, we, we know that we're still growing, that we've still got some rough edges on us that needs to be sanded down. But we do have the fullness. We have the anointing of Jesus because now we're in the family of God and not in the darkness anymore. Now, when it talks about the grace for grace, what he's talking about here, and, and it's a revelation that God has given to me, is that we're to, the first grace is talking about the grace of God that was bestowed to you and I because we've accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. For grace, that second grace is the grace that we have received from Jesus Christ and what he's done in obedience to the Father, given to us freely, we need to give that grace out to others around us to show the love of God, to show the grace that He has for us, the mercy He has for us, and to bring us into that. We have that fullness. We no longer have to just um, depend on self and our own ability. We now have the grace of God, the fullness of, of Jesus, the anointing of Christ, and the Holy Spirit on us that will take us farther than you and I can go just on ourselves. That's our key verse. Now, verse 17, And for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was a teacher. The law was, was teaching us what sin was. But it was also teaching us that we needed to have a Savior. We needed to have someone who had the ability to cleanse us and to empower us over sin in our lives. Now, Moses gave the law. But through Christ, his mercy, grace, and the truth about God's love and his power and his authority to you and I was brought to us by Christ Jesus. It was looked at in the Old Testament. It was, it was there, but it was not uh, brought out to us. It was still a mystery to those in the Old Testament. But now, uh, those of us living in the New Testament times, it is time for us to step forward and start being the witnesses that Christ has because we are anointed through Christ, the head of the church, to lead others to him and bring that light of him to them. Uh, verse 18, And no one has seen God at any time, but only the begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared him. In other words, God the Father has declared him through the power and authority that he's given him here on earth to do the will of God. And through that, Jesus is the only one who has seen God in completeness. Okay? We see only, as Paul puts it, through a darkened lens. We don't see all that God is, but we can uh, experience as much as we can by following Christ and living grace for grace until it's time for us to be taken out of this world and go home, whether that's through that doorway of death 
And it's only a doorway for the believers because we have eternal life. And then, uh, or rapture when we will be taken up with all. So here he's talking about the Son is, is a picture, a representative of God, the image of God, that you and I were also made images of God in the physical. And he's in God. He is close to God. He is a part of God. And he is completely in what Christ is doing. Uh, and then verse 19, and this is the testimony of John. We're talking about John the Baptist. Uh, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you a prophet? I am. I answered, no. And then he said to him, who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say of yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So here's the question that they was asking John the baptizer. If you're not the Christ that we should be looking for, who are you? And then basically he's saying, I'm a witness of him, but I'm not him. And my question for you, who are you? Are you living for Christ? Are you a child of God? If you're not, today is the day. Today is the day that you need to surrender to the word of God and his name is Jesus, so that you can have the power over sin, the authority over sin, that you no longer have to sin, but you can live holy and righteous as Jesus did, because he lived a life without sin. That's hard to, for us maybe to comprehend, knowing the way we are, but he accomplished it because of his nature of God in him, the way he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Today, when I ask you, who are you? Are you a child of God? Are you living for Jesus Christ? And is your life looking and living in his way? If it's not, today is the day of salvation. Accept him. In Jesus' name, I'll see you next week, and we'll continue with this. Christian faith is being called by other religions a bloody religion, and so it is, my friends. There's a crimson thread that runs throughout all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, and that's the redemption of man through the blood that God has chosen for an atonement. I'd like to read a scripture out of Leviticus 17, verse number 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. It is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Notice that the blood has one purpose in the eyes of God, and that's to be on the altar for man's sin. If a man was hunting in the wilderness and killed a beast, when he shed that blood of the beast, he was to cover it with the earth and not to eat it because it would belong to God and it represented the soul of the individual. You are watching the Christian Television Network.